was in school and uh, we watched it on TV. 12.56pm. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm not quite sure who these guys are, but uh, they sort of made into the presentation. Um, Neil Armstrong, the commander, Mike Collins, the command module pilot, he didn't walk on the moon, he was in command of the spaceship that orbited around the moon while the other two went down and landed, and, and Edwin, he's now officially called Buzz, Buzz Aldrin, on the right hand side. He was a lunar module pilot, but he actually didn't pilot the lunar module, so I don't know, don't know how he got the job actually. <laughs> so, take a couple of days back, it was Wednesday the 16th uh, of July, and uh, that's when the launch actually took place in Florida, and the, the actual launch time was 11.32pm uh, here in Melbourne, which was 9.32am in Florida. Now we actually happened to have somebody who was, who was there, um, well, let's stop for a second. This person just recently celebrated his 70th birthday, and what did he decide to do? He decided to jump out of a perfectly functioning aeroplane uh, on a parachute and uh, gave himself a temporary facelift by the looks on the way down. <laughs> Any clues yet? Anyone recognise this person? Okay, well, it's our very own Darren Lynch. And Darren's joined us here today. I'll introduce Darren in a moment. He's going to give us some thoughts and, and feelings of, of the day. So, the launch took place in Florida on this rocket, which is called a Saturn V rocket. People from all over the world and all over America went down to the launch area, they camped overnight, they took hotels, they did whatever they could to be there. Um, the launch control centre, there was a big launch control centre at the Kennedy Space Centre, which uh, managed their whole process of getting the, the launch, the rocket fuel and everything sorted out and, and, and uh, scheduled on time. And then the, the uh, the actual event took place. This is the launch control room. All those computers and all those banks there are, are the computers to manage and control the, the launch, the preparation of the rocket. Now, we've all, well, we've possibly all, all heard uh, the standard NASA description of the launch. This was the description as telephone through to Australia by Darren Hinch. Darren was over there in the quarter, and uh, none of this Skyping, um, you know, iPhone technology, whatever. It was a hard line, black and white, black baker light telephone, I suspect, uh, wired in, and then across um, to, uh, to Australia into the North Quarry Network. I'm going to play a little bit of the audio.
went to the microphone but I didn't eat. goosebumps as well actually. Um, it is strange being here because to, to talk about space and things like that on a day when in recent days all our thoughts have been on MH17 and our eyes have been skyward for the worst possible reasons because of the horror happening in Ukraine. And I was thinking as I drove in today back to a, a time about 18 months after Apollo 11 or two years later and I was at another space shot down in um, Houston and just outside Mission Control, uh, I walked through the bar at the Holiday Inn Hotel late at late one night, as two of those do, um, on NASA Boulevard 1. And there at the bar was Buzz Aldrin. And he's having a drink, as Buzz often tended to do. And he heard me order a beer and he heard my accent and he said, Oh, you're from Australia. And we started to chat. And why I tied into today is that as we sat there at the bar very late at night, he said he talked about the year that he and uh, Neil Armstrong and Michael Collins had just done uh, are touring the world as heroes and as the, the, the adventures that they were. And he looked at me and he said, you know, he said, for a minute there, he said, we really brought the world together, didn't we? We really brought the world together. And you say yes at the time, but thinking back 45, look 45 years later and uh, the answer is no, um, we didn't. We were there together briefly, but you've still got today people being shot out of the sky and um, what's happening in Gaza. But uh, my relationship with, with Buzz Aldrin was amazing because years, years and years later, I interviewed him about two years ago. And I'll never forget that interview because it was on the, the anniversary of the death of, of Neil Armstrong. And unlike Neil <coughs> Graham, I didn't have a chance to ever meet. I, I saw him at Armstrong press conferences and, and for the, the launch, you saw him coming out of the car there, to the, the wagon there, I was part of a press pool that was probably as close as six seats away from Neil Armstrong and Auden and Collins. They walked out with their, all their white suits and all their life support. And people, they were giving thumbs up. The people were crying. I mean, we didn't think normally what they were going to do because it wasn't that long since um, Gus Grissom and his crew had died locked in the cockpit of, um, of Apollo 1. And so he watched them go. But, so I hadn't spoken to, to, to Auden until I interviewed him on the death of Neil Armstrong in 2012. And I remember that very specifically because I had big plans, I still had plans to make a documentary in five years' time on the 50th anniversary of uh, Apollo 11. And I had planned to interview Buzz and also interview Neil Armstrong, which sadly is now, he died on the operating table. But I remember that for another reason too, because uh, Buzz Aldrin, I did that interview with him, walked out of my studio, walked, got a call saying, the management of 3 w want to see you. So I said, oh good, I'll be congratulating on this great. The only interview that Buzz gave that day, I walked into the office, they said, you're fired. So, <laughs> so I'll never forget that, the day of the interview with Buzz Aldrin. But just quickly, two things. We, we spent the whole night out there at, um, at Cape Kennedy. You saw some of the campers there. There were a million people, one million people camped around the area waiting for Apollo 11 to blast off. You had to get there the night before because of the traffic jams. And by 9 o'clock, 9.32, when it took off, it was so hot. You were sweating like pigs. It was so hot, I could barely hold the, the handle of the, you're right, it was a Bakelite phone, an old Bakelite phone, and I could barely hold that, but no iPhones, no, 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 no Skype, no nothing, but the gentleman over here with the beard, he was the 2G, he was the, the, he was the PMG technician who took my call through from Cape Kennedy, fed it through the PMG in Sydney into Brian White's studio at 2GB and then live to Australia. And to add to the, the six degrees of separation, the man who was um, uh, the panel operator for 2GB on that day, 45 years ago, who took the call from me to you, to 2GB, to Brian White, was a man called Graham Mott who went on to be my boss at 3AW, and he fired me. So it's all, <laughs> it all ties in very closely over the decades. And, but it just, if when you, when you just look at, you hear that again, just remember, it was, we, we were so close, even though we seemed to be about three miles away, the power of that building lifting off, the building being, being taller than, 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 than Crown, being 30, 35 stories high, lifting off so slowly, the noise and the powers you heard was so strong, sitting in that stand, it felt like you'd been hit in the gut with a baseball bat. And that night when I got home to my motel, and I was having a shower, we'd got about 48 hours, I looked down, I had these black strips across my tops of my thighs, and the bruises, and I wondered what the hell they were, and I realised that was from the, the power of that rocket as the 
desk was banging up and down on my knees while I was broadcasting. And that was the power of it, the sheer power. And I still look back and listen back to that 45 years ago in absolute awe of what the, the, the Americans did. And if you listen closely, if you ever hear it back again, I almost dropped a four-letter word live on Australian radio, 52 <laughs> stations, because in the moment there, I was just telling Darren James, the 3AW buff of, of, um, of uh, or everything in space, and I say it's a pause, absolute beauty. <laughs> I remember to this day how close I came. So anyway, enjoy the movie. Thank you very much. CD um, that that uh, audio was taken from is is available uh, from us in the foyer here and also through uh, through uh, uh, Darren's website. But we'll have details of that later on, so you can have a copy for you. Right so I just wanted to let you know now. I'm just about to finish talking, so you can relax. Um, we're just going to have the first half of the movie. We're going to have an interval. We're going to have a dish trivia. So I urge you to pay attention to the movie, the details, who's who, what they do, when they do it, because there will be valuable prizes. Then we're going to pick up the second half, and then afterwards, if you'd like to stay around, um, just be a short thing, but we're going to have a little bit of um, a look back at Apollo and Australia, because Australia was very critical in making the Apollo program, and indeed the, the manned space program and the border space program work. And we had a lot of uh, involvement, not just um, the one site that you see, but uh, a lot more. So sit back, relax, and... I've been here the movie. Thanks. <laughs>